with Gerd Leonhardt, the futurist and humanist author and CEO of the Futures Agency. Gerd, lovely to see you again. Um, let's start. It's, uh, we're going to talk about science, not fiction. Um, why are we looking at what's in front of us and not two or three steps ahead? Yes, good morning, everybody. It's a great pleasure. I'm, I'm here in Zurich, as you can see. This is not real, but it's pretty nice. <laughs> so, uh, well, science fiction, well, basically what's happening is that uh, humans are, uh, generally speaking, not so good at looking at things that don't immediately impact them. You know, I always say we only change because of pain or love. Uh, and that's been historically true with the nuclear bomb, the financial crisis 2007, and of course, COVID, right? But one thing that we've learned in the COVID crisis is that we must anticipate and prepare uh, if we are not going to be suffering major proportions of disaster. So this is a big learning from the crisis. You know, now we're putting real time and thinking and, and people are now saying basically COVID-19 was a test run for climate change, right? So, and this is triggering real action. So we are getting much better at foresight and the future is already here. We just have to take note, right? And, and this has a, been a very good learning. So I think what we're going to do now in the next 10 years, fundamental change of policy uh, and discussion about what we need to do to have what I call a good future. Uh, and, and this is now moving center stage as science fiction is actually becoming science fact, right? That is so much the truth. You know, when we look at things like 5G or the cloud or intelligent assistance and you know that stuff was yeah it was theory until now and now it's getting real well i thought there for a moment you were going to give us the uh, the famous william gibson quote one of my favorite sci-fi authors who says the future's already here it's just not very evenly distributed <laughs> i have a much better quote actually let's take this one from eo wilson who says the problem of humanity is that we have paleolithic emotions medieval institutions and god-like technology <laughs> okay. that, that is, that is so, a good so true right <laughs> well let's talk about these some of these technologies you know there's a lot of things already on the horizon augmented reality neuralink quantum computing a big one that we think may deliver leaps and bounds in change uh for in terms of what we can do with this godlike uh, technology uh, internet of things 6g facial recognition. I mean, where do you see these uh, technologies fitting easily into our daily lives? And, and what are the problems with them? Because there are certainly some concerns. Yeah, I think, you know, technology and science in general have pretty much all the tools to solve our practical problems. And that is communications, media, energy, water, food, you know, I mean, we're looking at plant based food now taken over from meat, right? I mean, mind boggling change. And now meat is made in the lab, you know, with uh, cultured meat. And Bill Gates and Richard Branson are involved in saying that maybe in 10 years that meat will be one tenth of the price of, of a dead cow, so to speak, right? So this is all happening right now. The problem with technology is that technology will never solve cultural, political, and human problems. It will make them worse, right? Because technology is an efficiency engine, right? And this is why we need to get uh, together and say, okay, we have the power of technology. Now, what about the power of the right policy? The, so I always say, you know, we, we will have all the tools, but will we have the telos, you know, the Greek word, which is wisdom and purpose. And, and this is what we need to do right now, because we can indeed use technology to solve all that stuff, but we have to make the right decisions in terms of distributing the benefit of technology, right? Uh, if we don't do that, then we're going to end up in a place where, yeah, it's the people who that own the tech that are going to be in good shape and everybody else is like racing behind. Yeah. And that well, needs to be changed. I mean, since we're talking quotes, let's quote Kranzberg's first law, which is technology is neither good nor bad, nor is it neutral, which is this way of saying it's all in the hands of the creator. There we go. Um, yeah. Europe is making this big push for citizen-centric technology. I mean, explain what that means, really, because a lot of people just think, does that mean putting the human at the center of it? Does that mean just making it useful, user-friendly? How, how do we turn that into something that is meaningfully ethical and meaningfully supportive of the sort of society we want to have? Well, since Apple is one of the sponsors of this event, I'll quote Tim Cook, who said something very smart. Uh, I'm generally being a smart quoter. He says, okay, uh, technology can do great things, but it does not want to do great things. It doesn't want anything. 
right? And there brings me to this uh, scene that I use. Oops, sorry, I don't want to do that. Um, where basically uh, technology has all of those cards, right? And we have those cards, like we have values and ethics. And, and, and so technology doesn't understand values and ethics. It doesn't care. You know, these are like murky human things. And, 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 and in many ways, in Silicon Valley, you have this understanding that the problem really is the humans, right? Because we are the problem in this, in this perfect world of technology. And we have to turn that around and we have to use a different approach, which I call this, yeah? I'll change the background so you can see this. Right? People, planet, purpose, and prosperity. Right? And if that is not going to be our paradigm, and people called that people, planet, profit, you know, 20 years ago, mm -hmm. but enlarging a little bit, then we have a problem, a disconnect, which says we can make lots of money with technology, we can fix everything, but the purpose will not be available for everybody. Right? And we're going to end up in the world that's totally po polarized, and, and that needs to be addressed. Well, the final question I wanted to ask you was about what if we leave the monopoly of innovation to countries that don't share our values, or parts of the world that don't share our values? I suppose in some ways we're thinking about China in the US and Europe are fairly still fairly close in terms of defining what they, 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 their principles are as democracy. <laughs> so far. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I think you'd be surprised to see that actually on a global scale, the most basic values are largely shared by everybody. Um, and that includes, when I talk about basic values, I'm not talking about having a house or a car or religion, right? I'm talking about being alive, <laughs> having a right to bring your kids into a better world, being educated, having civil rights, and 98% of the world would agree on what those things are, you know, what a good future is and what a not so good future is, no matter whether you're in China or Arkansas or, or Brazil, right? Um, and so I think we can actually agree on many of those things like we can agree when there's pressure, we're going to agree on what we want to achieve together. Maybe we can't agree on, you know, on brain computer interfaces or automated drones killing machines, you know, that, that those are discussions, right? But generally ag agreeing on the most basic principle, which is to further human flourishing. I think we do agree on that. I mean, one thing that tends to get people to agree is an external threat. I mean, perhaps if the aliens arrived, we'll, we'll all band together and use the tech in a useful <laughs> way. <laughs> True. One, one final um, just thought uh, that I'd be interested to hear your ideas on. It, do you feel there's an idea that if something's invented, it will eventually spread everywhere around the world regardless? You know, we invented fire. It, it's not just going to stay. I mean, we talk about there being no borders, but I mean, really in a, a sort of overall principle that all technology will eventually be everywhere. Yeah, but, you know, it's, it's part of the thinking, and this is why I use the fork in the road concept, you know. Uh, it's kind of the thinking that the future is happening regardless of what we want, and that is just complete garbage, right? Basically, we create the future, right? Every action we take, every inaction, and we make decisions about what is okay and what is not every day. And the future isn't just dropping down on us and technology will not just happen just because it exists, right? So yes, people will do all kinds of bizarre things with technology, including, you know, falling in love with a robot and what have you. But in the end, yeah, we're going to have a social contract, we're going to have regulation, we're going to have agreement on the basic cornerstones of this. And this is what humans are good at when they are forced to do so, right? Uh, so I would say the future is coming faster than we think. The future is better than we think, and the future is more designable than we tend to think. Final question then, what technology are you most excited about for the future and why, be it blockchain, CRISPR, quantum? Do you have a favorite? Yeah, there, there's a whole collection. Yeah, I'm, I'm really most excited about technology solving our energy problem at this point because we are going to decarbonize the world uh, in the next decade, and the technology is there. All we have to do is pour money on it, you know, like we did with COVID, you know, and, and this is what we're doing now. I mean, I'm really excited about essentially energy will become as abundant as music uh, on the Internet. Right. And we're all going to pay. We're all going to have uh, uh, the benefit of that. And that will change our world completely to the positive. Good. Thank you very much. A pleasure as always to speak to you. We've you. To do that very quickly, but that's the plan <laughs> for this morning to get through lightning talks at lightning speed and so we can pack as many ideas in as possible. Gerd Leonard, a futurist, gen ladies and gentlemen, do look out for him, follow him online and remember to keep sharing our comments today using the hashtag 